Hello there, welcome back. No matter what the hell is this? Um, of course we're going to the last action. Of course I'm going to get to this eventually. The Schwarzenegger disaster from the early 90s. This is his big follow-up to Terminator 2. This is a big film that could not bomb. This film was going to be the great follow-up to a, a, a series of big films that Schwarzenegger had starred in that all had done well. Like Total Recall, Terminator. It was on a run. You know... Every film was bigger than the last. He was he was having a really good run as a movie star at this time. He was trying things out, like Total Recall was a stretch for him. Terminator 2 was playing a good guy as a, a robot's a good guy. He was working with Ivan Reitman doing like um, Twins and Kindergarten Cop trying comedies out. He'd done Predator. He'd done a lot of stuff and he'd actually stretched himself quite a bit for what he was, which was a muscular action man. So he'd done a lot of good stuff and this is where it all came crashing down. And after this film, he's never the same. I mean, he made True Lies, which is enjoyable, but it was a bit bloated. And this is where he seemed to, like, always have films of a bigger budget than he needed and maybe less ideas than he needed. Like, before he always had better directors come in and flesh out the ideas to always make the ideas good. Now, this was the first one where it was like, you needed something more. Because the ideas and the execution don't really match up. And there's lots of reasons for this. And the big, I mean, the biggest reason, though, is you have a mismatch of story and director. Because John McTiernan directed... John McTiernan's a very good director. He was just coming off Die Hard and Predator. You know, had very tall, but he made Medicine Man, which was his first failure. But it was still in a run, though. He was still... Like, he followed this one up from Die Hard 3. Then he went into the 13th Warrior. And uh, Thomas Crown Affair. So he was still in a run of doing, like, good films... Some better than others, but they're generally entertaining films. They were, he hadn't hit, really hit the skids from the two thousand with Rollerball and stuff yet. He was, so so these two failures he had, Medicine Man, this one, we went down and went back up again. I mean, some films didn't do well, but it was quality wise, he was doing pretty well. But in this one, because McTiernan's a mood director, he builds mood and mood and builds up slowly but surely. And he does that with this film, and this film needed to be smart ass and Looney Tunes. So, you, so it takes you forever to get to the next sequence. And it really hurts the film. The pacing just kills it because it needed to be like 90 minutes long, it was about two hours long. And all the jokes are padded out, and the pacing, the, the direction is just all wrong. They got the wrong director straight away. The, one of the big problems of the film is the wrong director. And I'm, and I'm a McTiernan fan. But he was a wrong director for what this needed. Because they had Shane Black as a writer, and Shane Black is a fast paced writer. I mean, he takes his time setting stuff up, but he's always at very fast paced ideas, getting you to the next bit, to the next bit, the next bit. So he's a director that, you know, he's a writer who can have fast builds, and things are always happening in his films, and they always feel paced. So even if he's actually delaying something, He's got lots of business going on distracting you from the fact he's delaying something. So so he sidetracks you into somewhere else so you don't realise you're in a delaying tactic. He's a very smart writer. And he re and his scripts read fast and he needed a director who could pace it like hell. And he did not have this in this film. He had a director who was slowing it down and So these two the still of these two people who have worked together in Predator when Black was a was a acting predator, not a writer. You know. And they both always said nice things to each other, so obviously they respect each other. But they were not a good match as a writer and director because their styles are so different. You know. That one needs a fast paced director and one needs a slow paced story. And what and there was other reasons for the problems. One of the other big reasons for the problems was um I mean, one of the big things was the how Shane Black and Shane Black wrote a script that was unsuitable for Schwarzenegger and Tierney. Because Schwarzenegger was written as a smart aleck cop and he cannot play that part. He does not have this... He's an Austrian... Big Austrian guy. You have to take what's there and work with it and give him interesting things to do. In this one, he's playing a guy who's in a series of films. He's an action hero... But you don't believe him ever in this part in the first place. You don't believe they've ever seen the films. Because you can tell instantly this would be a one-and-done failure. Which the film was. 
because he, he's just outsuited. So they try to put a Schwarzenegger in a genre for the character who he's playing. Because he's basically the idea is a kid gets a ticket to let him go into a magical movie. So he's, so he's watching the movie and a ticket lets him into the movie and interact with the characters in the movie. So he's, so he's a big Schwarzenegger fan, so you know, Schwarzenegger film. Which is a really good idea. That's still an idea that could be done really well. But it's sure a Schwarzenegger film that you wanted to see. And this one, you're in a Schwarzenegger film that you don't want to see because you'd, it's an action movie about a, a ridiculous cop who doesn't really feel like he belongs in the world he's in, who's out for... He's, a, he's probably a Dirty Harry, but a PG version of Dirty Harry. And it doesn't work with Schwarzenegger like, at all. He can't play the part. So you have this massive hole in the middle of the film where a character that should have dragged you into this dynamic isn't there. He's just not there. There's nothing there that's dragging in. So no matter how interesting the premise is, it's not there. And no matter how many jokes make it being a movie, there's no dynamic between anybody that creates tension or creates a dynamic that's actually moving the story forward. It's just you're repeating the same scene again and again and again. So the story just keeps going and going round and round and round. And half the problem is also there's so many script writers in this one. This one can get rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. Um, because Zach Penn wrote the original draft for a friend, I get bought, that was, I got my industry. Then they liked the idea but didn't like the script. So they brought in Shane Black and offered him a lot of money, like a hell of a lot of money to do this. So he just thought, what's well, this assignment? I'll bring my pal in and we'll write it pretty quick. Well, that's what, I, that's what I've heard. But he tried and the original writers of the script hated his script. And then he get rewritten by Will Goldman who rewrote all of his script, and Shane Black hated that script as well, apparently. So, you different sets of writers hate what the person done to the script. And by the time, I think the Goldman script was basically bringing the kid a lot more, bringing the warmth a lot more, make it less brutal, make it slow it down a bit. Which meant you a, a, a film that needed pace, been slowed down by the director and the writer, and all the interactions just seemed vague and weird and... Like, there's a plot in this film that's too vague for any film. It's like, drug dealers are trying to corner other drug dealers. That's like a ten minute sequence in a film, that's a whole film. You know, it's just like a, a ridiculous plot for this film because the plot they're in doesn't support the, f the fictional film they're in. So putting then putting the postmodern side on it makes it even crazier because you're in a story you're not interested in the first place and then getting told it's just a movie. So and you can see why they brought all these people in, like when Goldman had done um Princess Bride, which was a story that commented on the fact that it's a story. So he's done a classic version of it. Shane Black's a very good writer, he's done classic versions of that genre. So he could have brought in a lot of the genre stuff. But the genre stuff that he seemed to have been bringing in was just vague and not suited to Schwarzenegger. And God knows what else was brought in by different writers because apparently there's other writers even after that. But it just is this vague narrative that doesn't hold up. What's worse about it is the kid's annoying. The kid's really annoying. I mean, um, I guess the thing that's commenting on a lot in this film is the kid is... Um, a movie fan, but he misses school to go to movies. He's self-indulgent. He's whiny. He's irritating. He thinks he knows everything too much. And he lives in New York, so you'd think he would know better than that. to be a bit street smart, but he's not. He's always like an early kid who's meant to live in New York, but he's not. So you, th you know he's not a New York kid because he's too stupid. He's an early kid, but he's from New York. And it's just an annoying kid. Really annoying kid, and he, he has no bond with Schwarzenegger's character. Schwarzenegger's character finds him annoying, and we all find him annoying. And the only thing that you like with Schwarzenegger is he finds this kid annoying. So that's a massive problem for the film, which it never gets over. And they're, they're trying to do Cause of Terminator 2, they're trying to do the, ape, the idea of Schwarzenegger with a kid because of Terminator 2, because Schwarzenegger, John Connor character, you know. But the two big problems here is one, He's a decent actor. 
I mean, Edward Furlong is a good actor, a good kid actor. He's in a lot of good stuff as a kid and as a young adult. He could act. He might not like the character that much sometimes in Terminator 2, but he knew he, was, he could act. And him and Schwarzenegger had a really funny bond that you could really connect with. And it really worked. This kid, the act of this kid is um, atrocious. He's really overacting the whole way through the film. You really want somebody to strip, you want the to kill him, basically. That's a massive problem. And, yeah, it's just, it doesn't work. Plus, the plot doesn't work either. So, he's overacting. Schwarzenegger looks like he's lost. The plot's wandering around all over the place. And I spent a lot of money on all these explosions all look pretty. Explosions are very nice. But all the narrative is based on this is a movie. And I'm telling this is a movie. And that gets boring. And this kid just keeps on telling you this again and again and again. There's all these weird in-jokes. And it's just nauseating. You know. It's just so annoying. It's like, wasn't anyone watching this film when they were making it? Like... They're costing all this money. We don't want to seem like this kid's really annoying. Like, how is Emma going to bond with him? So that's another big problem. The fact that the film was an enjoyable cult film, despite all these problems, is quite astonishing. Because I kind of like this film, even though I've told you all the problems it has. But I think because the idea's so good that they messed up so badly and. There is fun with messing around with Schwarzenegger's image. Like, even though they do it badly, there's still a lot of fun like him. Like some of the side gags are fun and some of the Shane Black lines are fun. And there's lots of really bizarre things going on in it. And they spend a fortune on it. And it looks really pretty. It's like it's like a lot of really talented people are misfiring in the same project. But because of talented people, it's really enjoyable. Even though, I mean, the worst thing really is still the kid. <laughs> if they replaced the kid, half this stuff wouldn't have been as big a deal. <laughs> you know. I mean, the weird thing is, why didn't they just get the kid from Terminator 2? <laughs> they wanted to do it, and we just been blatant about it. <laughs> I mean, at least I've been honest. You know. <laughs> so you could act. <laughs> It's, it's, it's just this one performance that is quite astonishingly bad. But, but luckily, the, the thing, other thing that really makes it good, though, is Charles Dance is in it. Charles Dance as Benedict de Villain is... They wanted Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman was too expensive. Plus, he probably read the script and thought, nah, no, 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 no. But Charles Dance, job and actor, took the part, and is having a lot of fun playing an over-the-top stereotype villain. And he's just having a laugh the whole time. He's really enjoyed himself. Anytime he's on screen, it's really enjoyable because he is complete contempt for every character in the film and he's a total joy to watch as he finds halfway... F when he goes into the real world later on in the film, we find the bad guys can win. And he's having a lot of fun with that. And he's a lot of joy throughout the film because he knows what film he's in. And the film he's in is better than the film you're watching. I mean, to show how good Charles Dance is in this film is his character makes no sense narratively in the whole film. It's just a plot point to mock the film in the first half and then get the ticket and going back into the real world. So it's watching into the real world and see that he's actually a fictional character. Which is what should have happened much earlier in the film. If that had happened earlier in the film, the film would have improved a lot. Because uh, you get the interest in a bit, you've only 20 minutes to explore it. Which is kind of weird for a film. That's what I was saying the other one about the narrative need to go much faster because the, the, the bit in the main, the bit in a film thing, they run into ideas really quickly and then they get to the, you're back in the real world, be a fictional character. And that's something that's interesting but only 20 minutes of it. And it's like, that's where you should have spent your money. That was more fun and more interesting than, there was a story there you could have done that would have much more suitable to Shane Black, to McKinnon probably as well. All this stuff, as soon as they get into the real world, is much more interesting. And Charles Dance's character has no motivation in the real world. Except for the fact that he can win the real world. Because he's not fated to die as the villain of the movie. 
he, he, his character doesn't have any real great idea, but Charles Dance is so good, it's so enjoyable, you just want to see what he's going to do. It's like, and that's the frustrating thing, is like, it's actually getting good as soon as you go into the real world and watch the next character, finds that he's fictional and suddenly becomes an interesting character. Like, we only got half an hour left of the movie and it's like, he's not been interesting for so long, but as soon as he gets into the real world, he becomes interesting. But you've only got to kill the, you've only, you've only really got the end of the movie now. And it's like, great, you actually found the film at the end. And that's frustrating about the film is, there is good ideas there. I mean, even the idea of getting into the movie and knowing how everything, all the conventions work, should have been good. But they needed to have a narrative that actually was worthwhile of the movie within the movie. To push that forward and be witty about it and to mess around with it and send it in strange ways. Which they never did because the, the main plot wasn't good enough. They didn't have a mechanic of why they kept it in there. He just had this magic ticket from Houdini. Which it would be much more interesting if they pulled him in to the film for some other reason that was actually within the film. And it would have been clever and weird. And if Bendix's character had a plot line that actually was supernatural. Like some weird conspiracy moving through the movies that finally came to fruition with him. And he's now, they're now leaving the movies. Something like that could have worked and could have been an interesting narrative. Instead it was just lazy stuff. You know, and it was just we just frustrating to watch a lot of talented people have a good working a good idea and consistently miss until it's too late. You know, that's just the frustrating part of this film. It's just like you, were, you there was something if you'd spent more time developing a script. If you'd given it another year and figured it out and not been so smug, because they were so sure because they'd Schwarzenegger the film would do make a lot of money. And he never looked at the film itself. And that's what they should have been doing the whole time. But alas, they didn't do that. They just made this smug movie. And it's just so frustrating because there was good stuff there. And people were trying. That's the annoying thing is, you can tell me Taylor was trying as a director to get a certain thing to work. He had an idea. It's just that he had the wrong script. He had the wrong mix of people. And probably by the time he realised that, it was too late and there was nothing he could do. Because I feel when it was one of those films that went in with great intention, this is a really cool idea, we'll really work it out as we go. And then halfway through you're realising, this isn't working. This really is not working. And the only person who's working is a villain. <laughs> you know. Who they rely on a lot in the second half of the movie. Because they didn't realise, oh that's the one that works. We better focus him a bit more. Because it's just, you just tell everyone was trying. Everyone wanted this to be good. They weren't. This wasn't a film where the people involved were lazy. Maybe the studio was lazy because they thought they'd Schwarzenegger. But the people involved, you felt they were giving it their all and they were just, they were just missing. And they, and they were so enthusiastic that I didn't think they realised till too late the kid wasn't working. And that, that thing just wasn't there. It just wasn't delivering. And there's a lot of fun gags, like the, like the actors playing the villain, showing up as themselves and stuff like that. There's lots of fun things in the second half of the film that was just more enjoyable. But the damage was done by then. It was just like... And they were messing around with repeating stuff that happened in the movie, in the film, and which would have been fun, but they never found the right twists on it either. And it was just, it was always this thing, is like, you needed someone to come in and actually do it. And they brought William Goldman. You'd think he'd have found ways to do that because he can be witty in his films. But I think that's, he was past his prime at this point. He was just taking the money. I mean, that's my guess because that script he was putting in there, that final script was, wasn't good. And I think, again, his reputation made people think it was better than it was because it was not good. It really was not good. If you look at William Goldman's scripts in the 90s, they were not that good. There was... An odd good one, but a lot of the time he phoned it in. I mean, uh, John Carpenter talked about when I was Invisible Man, saying it was the script he got from William Goldman when he joined the project when Goldman had left was kind of embarrassing and lazy and just was obvious stuff. So, you know, that happens. Sometimes writers don't do good stuff. And you can feel that in this one. It's just like this script. It's like, how can a professional writer actually look at this script and see? Oh, this is good. But it could have been rewritten. We don't know, but... There's a lot of talent here, and it's just very frustrating to see the talent does not deliver at all. But it's still an enjoyable film, even though it's a total mess. It's one of those frustrating things. But it's not on the same level of interest and messes as like Hudson Hawk or 1941. 
which I will get to. I adore Ranking 41. I'm definitely doing that film soon. Um, but it's not that level of interesting message, but it's still an interesting message. It's, you have to be in a good mood for this one. You have to be indulgent for a lot of its flaws. But it is interesting to see... This is the big, weird, self-indulgent film from the mid-90s. It is interesting to see how a film can go this far wrong. It did a bad luck of opening a week after Jurassic Park, which absolutely killed it as well. It just had no luck. It had no luck whatsoever. And the funny thing is Schwarzenegger, when he did Jurassic Park 2, Schwarzenegger was in Batman and Robin. I mean, he should not make a movie any time as a dinosaur movie. He just mm, skip a skip, because he's bad karma when it comes to being in movies the same year as a Jurassic Park movie. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it wasn't too rambling and weird. And that's me for now. So... Bye and have a good week.